Often Moore's law is incorrectly interpreted as meaning that technology is going to double in terms of performance and power each year. As we'll see, that's not exactly what Moore said, but it's still the yardstick that many people use. For a while it did seem that way, every new handset came with a massive hike in power and speed. But are phones still getting faster? Does Moore's law still apply to our modern mobile devices? Let's find out. The problem here is that it can be quite tricky to compare two devices or CPUs, seeing as they often aren't directly comparable. There's only so much we can glean from the numbers. So let's start off by looking at how clock speeds and benchmark scores have improved, before taking a deeper look at some of the other factors that might be affecting the differences we see. I'm a Samsung guy, I've got a few Samsung devices lying around, so let's take a look at how the flagships have changed over the years. So looking at this table, you can see that there's not really that much change between the S8 and the S7. Both are packing octa-core processors, and there's only a small difference in terms of the gigahertz. The Geekbench scores are pretty different though, and that's our first clue that there is something else going on here, but it's certainly not double the power. We have to go all the way back to the S5 before we see a quad-core with only 2GB of RAM and a benchmark score that's under half of what we see on the S8. Those of you who like to have the most powerful and fastest devices possible might be a little bit disappointed by that, but it is a little more complex than that as well. So as Gary has explained in a few of his previous videos, Gigahertz does not tell you the full story in terms of the performance of a CPU. So Gigahertz tells you the clock speed and that's how quickly a CPU can carry out a sequence of instructions. These are stacked up in order in what is known as the pipeline. So back in the day, doubling the clock speed would mean roughly double the power because it meant that the CPU could carry out those actions twice as quickly. But modern advancements in efficiency have gotten around this in some clever ways. So for example, an execution engine can now carry out more than one instruction at the same time through something called instruction level parallelism. This is sometimes referred to as the pipeline getting wider. Likewise, CPUs can now begin fetching the next instruction before the current one is complete by splitting those instructions down into smaller blocks. This is sometimes described as making the pipeline longer. So basically what methods like this mean is that although the clock speed might be the same, although the number of revolutions times around might be the same, the CPU is now carrying out more instructions on each go around. Therefore it's more efficient and faster despite the gigahertz being the exact same. To go even further beyond! Then you have things like the advantages and slight disadvantages of having multiple cores. You have the RAM, you have the GPU, you have the size of the cache. All these factors can influence those um, benchmark scores as well as the performance you see every day, even when the gigahertz doesn't actually change. But what Moore was talking about more specifically was the number of transistors that we'd see on a chip. He said that year on year, the size and efficiency of transistors should improve such that we'd see double the amount on the same sized chip. That would mean in theory that the number of transistors in your CPU should be doubling year on year. So when you see a CPU described as 10M, that actually means 10 nanometers. That means that half the length of a transistor cell is 10 nanometers on that chip. 10 nanometers is currently the smallest we've got, and the smaller the size of the individual cells, the more you can fit onto the chip. Currently, Samsung and TSMC are racing to bring us the first seven nanometer chip, and TSMC are also looking at building factories to create three and five nanometer chips. So this is something that's increasing rapidly currently. But the precise number of transistors is of course related to the size of those transistors, as well as the size of the chip. So of course, the density is only part of the story. If you've got a very dense chip, but it's tiny, you could still have fewer transistors than a less dense chip that is massive. So how many transistors are there in a modern flagship? Well, the Samsung Galaxy S8 has got the Snapdragon 835, and that has a whopping three billion transistors. Just to put that in perspective, the human brain has only got 100 billion neurons, and there's only just over 7.4 billion people on the planet. So that is a lot of transistors. Holy transistors, Bill! How does this compare to previous generations? Well, unfortunately, OEMs are a little less candid when it comes to transistor counts versus gigahertz, and I can't get that information for the S6 and the S7. However, Apple are a bit more forthright. We know that the iPhone 6 has an A8 chip in it, and that has two billion transistors. And we can compare this to the iPhone 5S, which had the A7 chip, and that had one billion. So that is quite a big hike year on year, even if it's not doubling. We also know that the iPhone 8 and 10 will sport the A11 chip with an incredible 4.3 billion transistors. And if that wasn't enough, the Kirin 970 is gonna have 5.5 billion transistors. 
So these are massive jumps in terms of speed and performance. It's over 9,000! I'm sensing a table coming on. So in this regard, we're definitely seeing some pretty big jumps each year and it almost seems to be speeding up. But then if we look at the difference in the Geekbench scores between the iPhone 5S and the iPhone 6, we can see that they're not actually all that different. And this might seem quite strange because the A8 has got double the number of transistors and they're otherwise pretty comparable in terms of their specs. So as you might have guessed then, transistor counts also can't tell us the whole story in terms of performance. That used to be the case when things were a bit simpler, but today, once again, things are more complicated. So another law worth learning is Denard scaling. Denard scaling tells us that as transistors get smaller, their power density should remain the same. And this tells us that the power usage of a chip should be more to do with the size of the chip and not to do with the number of transistors. And this is pretty important because otherwise, as we doubled the transistor count, we'd end up with hardware that required huge amounts of power to run and got extremely hot. So really, Moore's law doesn't work without Denard scaling. And actually, Denard scaling stopped holding up around 2000. So today, there's no guarantee that as density increases, so does efficiency. And that's one reason why doubling the number of transistors doesn't necessarily mean double the performance. And it's also down to OEM to decide how they want to utilize all those transistors. Not all of them will necessarily be used for pure computing power. Some might be used for power efficiency options, etc. So if we're being really strict, then Denard scaling is kind of broken and Moore's law doesn't apply it somewhat redundant these days. And Moore himself even revised his theory in 1995 to say that it would double every two years. And even then he said it was approximate. So now your phone isn't doubling in power year on year, but you shouldn't be too disappointed about that. It's kind of moot to think about it that way anyways. Your phone is becoming more efficient and smarter and cleverer at the way it uses the power it's got. It is getting faster and it's also improving in terms of the build quality, the screen resolution, the camera, the water resistance, the software optimization. If you compare a phone today to a couple of years ago, it's still pretty remarkable how far it's come even in that short amount of time. And as we go forwards, virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence and 4K screens, they're all going to push the need for faster and even more efficient performance even further. So there are some beastly phones on the horizon. So thanks a ton for watching guys, I hope you found this interesting. If you did, then please consider leaving a like, uh, maybe leave a comment down below, I'll be down there to answer any questions you have. Subscribe to the channel for more like this and hit the bell button to get notified. And of course, check out androidauthority.com for we are your source for all things Android.